Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. My name is Jake Patterson, and along with my co-chair, Sachin Agrawal, it gives us great pleasure on behalf of BAS and the section of Endourology to welcome everyone tuning into Stream 2 for another fantastic session. Endourology as a specialty has always been at the absolute cutting edge when it comes to evolving technology in our clinical practices, with an emphasis on advances in minimally invasive surgical techniques, as well as incorporating the latest imaging can offer us in both diagnostics and therapeutics. It gives us great pleasure, therefore, to introduce what will be a fascinating session on what the endurological future might look like. First two presentations relate to how AI might shape our practice. First, these will be from Dr. Richard Hawkins from Leighton Hospital in Crewe, who will tell us about how AI uh, is being used to help reduce radiation doses to patients from CT scanning. Uh, this will be followed by Navin Rad, uh, Ramachandran, uh, from UCL in London, who will be talking about AI and radiology reporting and whether we still need radiologists. Moving into therapeutics, we can look forward to what will no doubt, no doubt be an expert insight into advances in lithotripsy from Professor Robin Cleveland from the University of Oxford. Before the session is wrapped up, we'll talk about the future directions of travel in laser technology for endourology from Professor Turney, also from Oxford. We hope you find this session interesting and enlightening. Uh, the speakers are available in the web chat, so do ask, ask questions as we go and they'll be there to answer. Uh, and without further ado, over to you, Dr. Hawkins. Ladies and gentlemen, my name is Dr. Richard Hawkins, and I'm a consultant radiologist at Mid Cheshire Hospital's NHS Foundation Trust in Crewe. I would like to thank Baus for inviting me to speak at this session and to share with you my excitement at how AI is revolutionising image reconstruction and dose reduction in CT. Although the title might seem a little cryptic at the moment, I hope all will become clear very soon. I have no financial disclosures or conflicts of interest. I would like to share with you our journey into the world of deep learning CT reconstruction. It all began when our oldest scanner was replaced last summer. That scanner that replaced was the Canon Aquilian One Genesis Edition. Crucially, it was equipped with ACE, which is Canon's revolutionary new deep learning reconstruction technology, which was a radical departure from previous methods and a world first for Canon. What I'm about to tell you, therefore, only applies to ACE and Canon scanners. Other deep learning reconstruction algorithms have appeared on the market since, but I can't speak to you about their performance in the real world. So first of all, let us have a look at a brief recap of the history of re image reconstruction. First came filter back projection. This was fast because it made a lot of assumptions and therefore required less computing power, which was a scarce resource in the old days. As it's been around the longest, this kind of image reconstruction is what most radiologists know and prefer to look at, mainly because of familiarity, but it also gives the highest doses. Next came hybrid iterative reconstruction. This required more computing power, which is why it didn't appear until the mid 2000s, but it did give lower doses. It does give a different look to the images, which can appear waxy when it is applied to a high degree. Therefore, it was blended with filter back projection to make it look more acceptable, hence the hybrid tag. Next came full model-based iterative reconstruction. Now this gave very low, doses, very low doses indeed, and also much higher image quality by modeling every aspect of the imaging chain with no assumptions. But consequently, this required a lot of computing power, which at the time wasn't cheaply available, and hence the process was very slow. For example, when it first came out, it took over two weeks to reconstruct just one scan. And another issue is that Radiologists complain the images look very plasticky or as if they were painted by watercolours, particularly in the abdomen. And this was dislike, disliked by many. So the golden triad of high quality, high speed, ultra low dose CT images has proved an elusive dream for a very long time. Until now, only two of these three parameters could be achievable at any one time. That is until the advent of deep learning reconstruction in the form of ACE when at long last, all three became possible together. And this was revolutionary and a turning point in image reconstruction. So 
So what is ACE? Well, ACE stands for Advanced Intelligent Clear IQ Engine. It uses artificial intelligence to remove noise and enhance true signal within the CT image during reconstruction. As I'd already outlined, this was a world first for Canon, who in my opinion are still the leaders in this field, although other solutions are becoming available now from under manufacturers. ACE uses deep learning, which is a subset of machine learning, and that in itself is a subset of artificial intelligence. Deep learning systems do not need to be explicitly programmed, but learn a task through experience by giving lots of examples, much like a human learning a new skill. The key to this is the deep convolutional neural network or computer brain, if you will. This mimics both the organization and operation of the brain. Such systems have taken the world by storm in the fields of speech recognition and facial recognition, often outperforming their human counterparts. And they're now being utilized in numerous other areas, particularly the quest for driverless cars. So how does ACE work? Now there are two key stages, the training stage and the operational stage. The neural network is initially trained by showing it thousands of sets of matched images, one ultra high quality, the other low quality. Through the deep learning process and by millions of adjustments to its neural connections, the system teaches itself how to remove the noise from the low quality images and transform them into the high quality ones. Now this all occurs in controlled conditions in a computer laboratory in Japan. And when the system is deemed to be optimally trained, it is fixed at that point in time and cannot learn anymore. The system is then shipped in that state to the relevant sites. And once it's operational, starts transforming the low quality data acquired into high quality images. You can see this a bit better in a pictorial form in this slide. So ACE differentiates noise from true signal. It removes the noise, preserves image texture, actually improves low contrast resolution. In fact, it's the best technique for that of any technique ever found. And it actually improves spatial resolution. So on the left here, you can see the low quality image. Then you can see the noise that's removed whilst preserving the edges and texture. And then finally, you can see the output image on the right. Now, in order to do this, huge computing power is required to reconstruct the ACE images fast enough for real world use, particularly inpatient use. Fortunately, the cost of computing power is falling all the time, driven by the insatiable demand from the gaming industry and the quest for driverless cars. So Canon went into partnership with NVIDIA, which are major players in this field to solve the problem. The solution was something called the ACE server, which is basically a supercomputer inside your scanner. Now the power of that, as you can see, is 71.2 teraflops, which is huge. And it does that by having eight high-end graphics cards working in parallel. To give you an idea of what that means, now IBM's Watson supercomputer, which you can see here, which was a huge thing back in 2011, had 80 teraflops teraflops of power. Now Watson actually beat two reigning champions at the TV show Jeopardy in 2013 and then has gone on to aid medical uh, management and decision making in lung cancer at Memorial Sloan Kettering Hospital in New York. But as we all know 18 months is a long time in computing and since then the latest consoles which are just coming out Xbox X and PS5 both have 12 teraflops of power each. Interestingly, the card you see on the right, the RTX 3090, has got the same power now in a single graphics card you can buy for your PC as the Equilium One Genesis. And on the left there, that's the latest chip from NVIDIA, the V100, which is 100 teraflops of power on a single chip. And that will continue to evolve without a shadow of a doubt. So how does ACE perform in the real world? Well, we, I'd like to give you the latent deep learning experience. As we said, the Equilium One Genesis was installed last summer. We went live on the 1st of July in 2019. Now we were privileged to be one of the very first sites in the UK to use ACE. 
Uh, and at the time, nobody knew how to use this technology to its best advantage. It was that new. Now we have a track record of aggressive dose reduction in our department and our goal was to push the boundaries, exploit the full potential of ACE and audit our results to prove the benefits. Now, just to give you an idea of why dose reduction is important in neurological CT, this is just a bit of data from our own department, which and we're classed as a small DGH uh, from last year. Now, as you can see, CTKB and CT urogram are very common examinations, and a large proportion of the examinations are in younger patients, particularly for CTKUB. As you can see, 27% of, of the patients were under 40, and more than 68% of the patients were under 60. And also many of these patients require follow-up scans because of stone follow-up. With that in mind, we went on to develop what we like to call the ghost protocol. And the reason we call it that is because the doses are so incredibly low. So when we audited this with the GHOST protocol, the mean DLP um, for using this protocol was 78.6. Now in millisieverts, that's 1.17. Now if you compare that with the older scanners, the mean DLP for that was 321. So it was 76% lower than our previous scanners and 82% below the national dose reference level, which is 440 milligram or 6.6 .6 millisieverts. Now, depending on how you calculate it, that's actually a lower dose than a plain film, which is 1.4 millisieverts. So we would like to pose the question, is the X-ray KUB now extinct? Well, in our department, I can tell you it is. So here's an example for you. On the left is the image reconstructed with ACE. And if you construct, reconstructed it with filter back projection, that's what it looks like on the right. So it's just a huge amount of noise. You can't make out the kidneys at all. So this is the kind of increase in quality um, that this system allows. So here's an example on the left, um, a follow-up CTKUB, the DLP was only 67.1. Previously it was 418. So you've got 84% dose reduction, and as you can see, the images are even better. This is the same thing. We're looking in the axial view. You can see the, see the kidneys far more clearly with far less noise on this image. Now, next we move on to a follow-up scan in a large patient. Now, the area of bariatrics we found is something which deep learning reconstruction seems to make the biggest difference of all. In fact, our biggest gains in terms of improvement in dose and image quality have been with the very largest patients. And the genesis can take patients of up to 350 kilos. Now, at that size, you're more likely to be too big for the bore than you are to be too heavy for the table. So if we look at this patient, we look at their scans. So the DLP on the follow-up scan with ACE was 245, now 3.7 millisieverts. If you look at what it was previously, that was 19.3 millisieverts. So a huge dose reduction of 81%. And you can see the images look better. There's the same thing in actual view. And you can see the difference in quality, how ACE, despite that dose reduction, gives better quality. Now, this is a theme that you see running all the way through. Now, this image here on the left is actually the very, very latest version of ACE, version two, which shows that with the follow-up on a large patient again, the DLP was only 108.6, but it was 443.5 before. So 76% dose reduction and the image quality is fantastically better. You can see the difference there. Now we found that with ACE version two, the image quality has improved no end compared to ACE version one, yet the doses are still just as low. So we didn't stop there. We actually did the same thing with CT urography and apply the GHOST protocol to that. Now, we currently still use three phases. The GHOST parameters are actually used on the KUB and urogram phases, and then we use a slightly 
higher dose, higher quality portal venous phase in between, but by most other system standards, that would still be classed as ultra low dose. But triple phase means triple the dose savings. So when we looked at our data, we found that the mean dose dropped with ACE to 401.9, so six millisieverts. And that was compared to a previous mean dose of 1,352 DLP, so that's 20 millisieverts. So that's a 70% dose reduction compared to our previous scans. That's 65% less than the national dose reference level. If we dropped to a two-phase protocol, then we could further reduce the mean dose to 4.7 millisieverts and a single phase to 3.5. Now, even at triple phase, these doses are comparable to traditional IVUs. And again, plain film equivalent is now possible. So let's show you some examples. So here we have a CT urogram on the left, showing the follow-up image on ACE. And on the right um, is the old scanner, and you can see the difference in dose reduction. It's halved the dose, and yet the image quality is better. So here we have the portal venous phase. That was previously was the KB phase, and again, it's the same story again. You can see, despite the half the dose, the image quality is better on the left. Here's the urogram phase to show you that it is, continues the theme throughout every single phase of the examination. And also, those images on the left are actually thinner slices than on the right, which would be traditionally would be noisier. So it just shows you how good the images are, and you, it maintains the quality down to the thinnest slice. So here's a follow-up with the very latest version of ACE, where the DLP for the whole triple phase exam was 229. And the, the DLP for their head scan that they had a week before was 600. Now this is quite a large patient and goes underlines what we talked about before about how it's particularly good within the field of bariatrics. Now this was a three phase CTO, CTU using ACE version two and the DLP on this large patient, you'll see how large in a minute, was 10.8 millisieverts. Now previously, and that's what you're seeing on the right, the dose for just an abdomen and pelvis was 28.5 millisieverts. And you can see all the artifact and image noise in that image. And that was just for a single phase. And just to show you, I wasn't joking, this patient um, was actually the size of them. They had a BMI of nearly 60. And such patients are always difficult to image. So future directions. Well, ACE will undoubtedly continue to evolve. Version two is already here. We were lucky to be one of the very first sites to be upgraded, and we're already seeing a clear increase in image quality whilst maintaining ultra low doses. Uh, new improved algorithms will occur with more training, more specific algorithms are likely to be developed, and with more computing power, it will become even faster or allow a development of even more sophisticated neural networks, allowing further improvements and precision. And in my view, this will undoubtedly become mainstream in the future. So hopefully I have given you, shown you what has whetted your appetite for this technology and given you a glimpse of what I truly believe is the future of CT. Now, I'd like to extend a huge thank you to all the team involved here at Mid Cheshire, without which none of this would have been possible. And also I'd like to thank Canada Medical for their continued support and belief in what we are doing and trying to achieve. So thank you for your attention. Hi there, my name is Navin Ramachandran. Um, I am a radiology, re well, not registrar anymore, I'm a consultant at UCLH. And the title of the talk today is AI in Radiology Reporting. But the subtext is, am I out of the job? And I think these are things that we'll touch on briefly. And I want you to think not just about radiology, but any medical specialty, because I think this applies to any medical specialty and actually to jobs outside medicine. So. My background, I'm a radiologist at UCLH. I'm a clinician builder on EPIC and a SNOMED CT builder as well. Uh, I've set up a few things for NHS Code for Health and I'm on the board of directors for the IOTA Foundation and the Eclipse Foundation. 
and we deal with open source software. Um, so this is how I like to start my AI talks. When people talk about AI, there's lots of different words for it. There's statistical inference, there's machine learning, and artificial intelligence. And there's a really nice saying, if people are using the word, the words AI, it's usually a PowerPoint talk, and it's more about hype. And if they're actually talking about machine learning and the mechanics of it, and if it's computer programmers, it'll be written in Python or another programming language. And I think that's how I tend to look at papers or any talk. So if it's the language used and how effusive they are, sometimes correlate with the hype curve involved. So let's get down to the basics. What roles can AI play? And this video here is, is something that we did at UCLH with UCL Computer Sciences, um, looking at organ segmentation. So these are kidneys pre-nephrectomy, how we could automatically segment out the organs and the different structures, the tumors, and then project them onto a VR system called HoloLens made by Microsoft and use that for pre-op planning. That's what we were playing with about four or five years ago. And if you look at research up to 2017, that's the figure on the left-hand side. A lot of work was done around segmentation because this is quite hard manual work and you could automate that. Um, there's other things that you say, can you detect a calculus or a tumor? Can you classify and say, is this a kidney? That's kind of work we touched on in this, uh, in this project as well. But it tends to be quite distinct entities that, that have been looked at there. Now, if you look at papers, it's, it's a more wide ranging scope. And when you look at what you're trying to do, think, I try and think about it in this order. So from top to bottom, you'll see the pictures on the side, less money, more money, uh, as in how lucrative these can be. So the, at the top is the more mundane stuff like daily workflow. Can you use AI to schedule more accurately? Accurately. Can you protocol scan so they get the right kind of scans, prioritize them so the right patients are done first or reported first um, when there's a massive list to report from? Doing the scanning, can you use it to reduce overall dose of radiation give to patients and then make sure you actually cover the right organs because we sometimes get scans where those organs aren't covered. Radiomics is getting a bit more complicated where you say, can you take automated measurements or look at features that radiologists wouldn't be able to see with the naked eye? And just by looking at the, the source data, can you pick up patterns that just couldn't be visible to a radiologist? And building up biobanks of imaging that can be used for machine learning. We've already looked at segmentation and what you can do with that. CAD is computer-aided diagnosis. So can a computer help you to, to diagnose a tumor and could it act as a second reader? So things like breast radiology, where they quite often you have two different radiologists for safety, looking at a scan, could you use a computer to be the second reader or even in the future, the only reader? Can it do a structured report? So rather than a long narrative text that's hard to read, can you take a report and turn it into a structured entity that people find easier to read and glean information from? And the, the holy grail is, as we talked about, do you actually need a radiologist in there? Can you just put a scan in and get a, in a, get a report out? And when you're looking at this, I think what drives this kind of innovation and this kind of research, there, there is a scientific basis to it and a, and a quest for knowledge, but there's also a business model behind it. I think that for anyone looking at what is going to happen next, you've got to look at the disruptive innovation model. So most of the time you hear X is going to disrupt this industry, and most people have the wrong understanding of what disruption means. Disruption doesn't mean I'm going to go and break up the whole industry. The disruptive innovation model um, is about looking at what a big competitor does. So a big competitor has to service millions of clients and it can't keep everyone happy. So what it tends to do is make the richest, most highly paying customers happy. And it kind of makes the the other people are less happy because you don't deal with them as quickly. Their bugs, their feature requests aren't dealt with. So what a, a disruptor comes and says is, look, there's not that much money to be made here, but we're gonna provide a good service for these poorly paying things, establish a customer base, and then take over the rest. That's kind of what every business model has done. So when you're looking at that, you've got to think within your specialty, what are the low profit services that are ripe for disruption? 
in imaging, I'd say it's things like plain films, like normal x-rays that have a backlog and just aren't sexy. And I'd, I'd predict that's what goes first and that's what's gonna happen. Um, and if you look at what's happened in other industries, so how does AI actually take over an industry? Well, there's always talk of disintermediation. They say, okay, you want a service, there's a middleman to that service, let's get rid of them. They talk about democratization of data. So they say that all this data should be freed. These people should own it, it should be let go. And what you end up with is a massive increase in data that you need to analyze. And when you get that much data, it can't be handled by any one person or any group of people. It needs automation and sorting. And that's when the AI comes in. And when you get that AI taking over it, the curators of the data are in control. So if you look at in, in books, news, music, video, commerce, that's what's happened. If you look in search, who controls news now? It's Google and Facebook. Who controls commerce? It's Amazon. It's not because they're offering the product itself. It's offering the curation of how to get it. I think that is probably the future of where AI and companies will get into, into healthcare and radiology. So when I look at the tech, there's different ways to assess how good it is. There's things that worry me. So how do I know that it's assessing it properly? The, the sexier, newer tech uses deep learning networks, which essentially is a black box. I put an input on one side and it gives me an output on the other side. If it's a wrong output, I tweak a few knobs until it's the right output. And I repeat and repeat with lots of data until it's giving me the right kind of output all the time. But I actually don't know what the knobs do. So the question is, if you don't know what it does, it's very hard to out it what it actually produces in the end and how it will react to new data. There's problems with how these algorithms work. So this is the duck or rabbit test. So if I turn the picture 90 degrees, it can be thought of as a duck in one, in one orientation and as a rabbit as another, in another orientation. If you look at machine learning algorithms and the output from it, you can see the, 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 the interpretation changes completely. The, the picture on the right is something from this week, in fact, where they had an AI controlling the camera in a football match. And in the whole football match, the camera followed the linesman because he had a bald head which it mistook for the, for the football. So these are the kind of things that, well, this, these are really egregious examples. So it's obvious there's something wrong going on, but when little things happen often and it's a difficult to spot, then you can end up having compound effects that have an effect years down the line are very hard to spot. We also know that it's, there are ways of attacking it. So this slide here shows on the left, the, the chest x-ray on the left is normal, on the right it's pneumothorax. And by adding little things like changing the contrast, or adding extra pictures or extra pixels, or changing the color very slightly, they made very obvious changes here, but they can make much more subtle and invisible changes. It can completely change the, uh, the output of the AI, so it gets completely the wrong results. So these are prone to, to be attacked. The other thing about assessing it is that we was predicting a few years, you can see a glut of publications come through. And because it's sexy and, and it's of the now, people will want to publish. But who can actually assess this? I'm asked to review a, a whole bunch of papers, but I often tend to decline them. Because look at this, deep learning based CT image reconstruction, initial evaluation targeting hypervascular hepatic metastases. To, to get understand this properly, you're gonna have to be good at medicine, you're gonna have to be good at radiology, especially hepatic, like hepatobiliary radiology. Plus you're gonna have to know about good statistics and good machine learning models and what's the wrong way to approach this when it comes to machine learning. And the, the number of people who have that cross section of skills is very small. So I suspect that a vast majority of papers aren't adequately reviewed. So we're building an evidence base without proper uh, checking or assessment, I think, or at least we're at the risk of that. This is a really great paper which came out very, very recently in the BMJ uh, by a group of people um, based here and in America, looking at studies of these deep learning techniques, AI, and how they compared against clinicians. And you can see from that, the, the conclusions are there. There's high risks of bias. They're not randomized. They don't follow current protocols. You don't know 
you don't have the data available to check the human comparative groups are small. There's lots of issues with it. And overall, the evidence is still poor. Not that I think that means it won't change in the future, but I think there's inherent problems with the way we assess things now. That's the current state, but I think in the longer term, we're going to have a bigger issues as the, we're going to have bigger issues as these technologies take wider, uh, uh, take a wider role in, in imaging and in, in medicine overall. So these are things I just want you to pick up on. So I'm just going to touch on all these points very briefly. Number one, all these systems that tend to be called decision support rather than diagnosis. And that tends to be because if they take the primary diagnostic role, then their litigation risk is much higher and the lawyers will come in. So you'll notice they're often called decision support and the liability still lies with you. If these systems end up taking majority of the decisions, you'll end up with a de-skilled workforce who won't be able to land a plane properly. And that's kind of happened now. The airline pilots have lost some of their flying skills. Liability, when something goes wrong, who's liable? Actually, at the moment, it's still the uh, clinician who uses that as decision support. The other thing that's just come out with Tesla this week or last, there's still an expectation that if something happens that goes wrong, there's a human still in control. But if you're not paying full attention to the road when you're driving, and you're expected to make a sub-second decision, you won't do it. And I think that's similar in, in medicine. If you're not in control and analyzing everything, it becomes much harder to spot an error. Um, and as time goes on, we'll move from these recommendations to automated decision making. And that happens to an extent now, because when you have lots of data, it has to curate it down for you. So Facebook will give you a view of what it thinks your reality should be, same as Google. And if they want to blacklist something and not show you and, and act as a censor, then they can. These decisions are already being made for us. There's also bigger issues with how do you regulate these things? So medical devices have quite strict regulation. They don't know what yet to do with these AI, AIs yet because they're software and they change rapidly. More importantly, you, these will change from day to day as they learn new things. So how often are they allowed to change and how rigorously do you, do you check them? And each time you have to check them, you need another training data set to check against which is going to be difficult because you're going to run out of training data sets when you keep having to recheck them if they they change very regularly so that's a big issue and as they become more encompassing you get very subtle ethical dilemmas about making automated decisions on your behalf we won't get into that but have a think about if it's making subtle decisions about you all the time could it end up doing the wrong thing and make something based on values made by people in Silicon Valley rather than in your particular country. We also know these things can be manipulated. So I, Google has been fined for, uh, there you go, Google's been fined 2.4 billion for altering search engine results to favor its own products. Google bets on European biotech drugs. So when you have companies who have fingers in many pies and decision support and recommendation engines, you have to keep an eye that they're not favoring their own products. And if you do it wrong, you can end up creating massive bias at a massive scale. We all have bias. I know I am biased in my own way, but my sphere of influence is very small. I can only affect a few people. But if an AI has that same bias over a whole population, then very subtle things can have massive impacts over a long time. So essentially, it's a very, very complicated situation. Am I out of a job yet? I don't think so, and I don't think the evidence is good enough at this point. Could it happen? I think it could, and I think there's massive risks associated with it. Thank you. Hello, my name is Robin Cleveland, and I'm in the Department of Engineering Science at the University of Oxford, and I'm also attached to the Oxford Stone Group at the Churchill Hospital uh, in the Oxford University Healthcare Trust. And today I'm going to be talking to you about uh, engineering advances to do with lithotripsy, and in particular three different areas. One is use of birth waves to break up stones, tractor beams to move stones, and then acoustic monitoring to see what's going on inside of the kidney. 
The key uh, acknowledgements for this, a lot of this work has been funded by the National Institutes of Health in the US and by uh, a program project grant that's been around for more than 25 years now. I've been part of that team and I have colleagues at the University of Washington, Indiana University, Caltech, University of Illinois and Moscow State University who've contributed to this work in different amounts. So the first area I'm gonna to touch on is burst wave lithotripsy. Um, and this comes out of the group at the University of Washington, in particular, Michael Bailey and Adam Maxwell. And it was motivated actually by technology that NASA wanted uh, to be able to fly on their mission to Mars. Uh, kidney stones are considered a serious problem to do with astronauts due to, due to bone loss um, and that calcium turning into stones. And so they needed a technology that they could fly that would be able to break up stones. And so the group at the University of Washington developed a small handheld device that could be both diagnostic and therapeutic for use in space. Um, and they now have converted that to be something that can be used for office-based treatment of kidney stones. So just how it compares, uh, here's a classic shockwave lithotripter, it's the Stortz uh, F2 that's based at the Churchill Hospital. So it's a large installed system. Um, the sort of shock wave that it produced, you can see here, this is time in microseconds, pressure in megapascals. It produces a pulse that lasts about five microseconds. It's got peak pressures on the order of 50 megapascals. This is focused down to a beam on the order of about six millimeters. And these are shock waves are fired in, depending on how you use it, but let's say on the order of one, one hertz at one shock per second. In comparison, the burst wave lithotripter device is a small handheld device, which has an imaging transducer and a therapy transducer on the outside. And rather than a short pulse, it generates a burst that lasts for about 50 microseconds, has peak pressures on the order of seven megapascals. A similar be beam width to what you'd have with a, a, a shockwave device, but these uh, pulses are fired much more rapidly on the order of 10 hertz or so uh, to, to be able to break up the stone. And in both cases, it takes on the order of 30 minutes of treatment to treat a stone. Um, here's an example on the left of a stone in vitro, a COM stone that's being hit with burst wave lithotripsy. And you can see it, it breaks up a little bit like you might have with dusting if you were doing uh, laser lithotripsy. And on the right are some COM stones that have been implanted into a pig uh, kidney, um, looking into the calyx. And now this are also being hit with burst wave lithotripsy. Um, and this is at a slower rate, so it looks a little bit more slowly, but you can just see uh, material starting to come off of these stones and being eroded away due to the burst waves. So it breaks up stones uh, very well in vitro and in vivo. Um, the other advantage with burst wave lithotripsy uh, is associated with injury. Um, so for those of you who perhaps read some of the injury, often with shockwave lithotripsy, we see uh, a lot of uh, hemorrhagic damage um, to do with a clinical treatment. In and and the, the right here is a, a kidney that's been treated with, a pig kidney that's been treated with a standard treatment of shockwave lithotripsy. And we can see a region of damage down here in the lower pole. Um, for kidneys, the pig kidneys have been treated with burst wave lithotripsy, they've done the histology, um, and for the sort of frequencies they normally use, which is about 335 kilohertz, uh, there's less than 1% of the, the, the renal volume that has suffers any damage. So it seems to have a much lower uh, uh, risk associated with, with damage. So burst wave lithotripsy, then a technique to potentially break up stones in a nice safe way in, in an office-based environment. Next topic is acoustic tractor beams. And this is work that's been done, led by Leg Saposhnikov at Moscow State University and Mike Bailey at the University of Washington. The motivation behind this is sometimes when stones are being broken up, that fragments can get trapped in, in calyces or down in perhaps a lower pole. And so actually expelling those fragments out can be a, a real uh, issue. And so the idea is if, if you have an ultrasound array with hundreds and hundreds of elements in it, if you adjust the phasing in all those elements, you can create, and the, the map here shows an acoustic field, and you actually create a set, essentially a little pair of uh, tweezers here, acoustic tweezers that can hold on and move an object. So in here, if you've got a little stone here and you grab onto it, and then if you adjust the phasing in the array, you can actually drag that stone around and reposition it wherever you want. So here's an experimental setup. This is using their burst wave lithotripsy type array. So they've got an array here with hundreds of elements, an imager in the middle. Uh, this is all done in water. And then they have a container here and there's a little glass bead that's placed uh, in this container. It's four millimeters in diameter. And they're gonna turn on the tractor beam and try and drag it and move it around. So this will be the movie on the other side. So you could just hopefully just see here, here's the glass bead. And I'll start this movie now. 
And they've come in, they've now grabbed the stone, uh, the bead, and they're moving it up, jiggles around a little bit, and they're, and they're moving across to the right. And then they'll let the stone come back down again. So this is being done non-invasively, entirely just using acoustic waves to grab and move this four millimeter little glass bead around. So that's it working in a water tank. Um, it also works uh, in, uh, in an animal. So this is a, a COM stone that's been placed in a pig, this is actually in the bladder of a pig. And again, it's moving around, not because of fluid motion, but because it's been grabbed by an acoustic tractor beam outside of the animal and then being translated around inside of the, inside of the kidney, inside of the bladder, sorry. So that's the ability of then of acoustics to move stones around actually inside the body without actually needing to directly touch them. And then the third topic is passive acoustic mapping. And this is work that's done with my colleague at Oxford, Constantine Kusios, and a postdoc here, and a PhD student, Kia Shore, and postdoc, Erasmia Laika. And the idea is to try and record acoustic emissions that come from the kidney during lithotripsy to try and monitor both stone fragmentation and any potential issue to do with stone damage. So the system we've set up here to do that, to, to monitor so we have a pig kidney, again, in a water bath connected to a Stortz uh, lithotriptor. And then outside we have a standard ultrasound imaging system. This is a relatively high frequency, uh, four to 11 megahertz ultrasound transducer. Um, and so the system setup we have is shockwaves firing into the kidney. We have this, trans, this imaging transducer outside and we use it in a passive mode. So rather than sending in an, a pulse and listening to echoes, we actually listen to the noise that's produced in the kidney as the shockwave passes through. We record this on, uh, on a Verisonics Vantage, which allows us to do lots of signal processing. And then those signals are recorded and stored in memory. And then we can create a map. And for each point in the map, we take the signals that we've recorded and we adjust them to, uh, to associate the signal that came from a particular location. And so by doing some simple geometry for that particular location, we can align up those pulses we add them up and that gives us the amount of energy that arrived in this particular spot. And then we can do that for every point in this little, in this little uh, array. And so we can actually build up a map of where the sound is coming from. So here's an example of uh, a signal from, uh, from using uh, energy level of three on the Stortz uh, lithotriptor. I've got imaging array sitting out here, the shock waves coming in through here. X is the focus for this kidney, and actually this is the collecting system. You can see a few lines. These are actually interference with the shock wave with the imaging. Um, and so, but there's no major uh, cavitation or any other activity going on. And that's typical when you're running the lithotriptor at this relatively low case. If we ramp up to a higher level, so we go up to energy level six. Um, and now every time we fire off the shockwave, we can actually see these regions of red in here in the collecting system. Those are, uh, those are bubbles that are growing and collapsing inside the collecting system. We can actually see them evolving in real time as we map this signal. All right, so to conclude then, uh, the three things I've talked about that have potential to advance. First wave lithotripsy is an emerging technology for, for office space diagnosis and treatment of kidney stones. And right now in Seattle, they have treated 10 patients to date, um, successfully breaking stones and without any, any side effects. Acoustic tractor beams are a way that which we can use sound waves to uh, outside the body and focus them in and actually manipulate and move stones around inside of the kidney. And this may help clear fragments that are being stuck in certain calices. And finally, we have this technology called passive acoustic mapping, which allows us to monitor both tissue damage and stone fragmentation in real time during lithotripsy by passively listening to the sound that's, gener that's generated during those processes. So thank you very much for your attention. And that's the end of this talk. Uh, thank you for the opportunity to give this talk on uh, laser technology and uh, high powered lasers. Um, I'd like to give a talk today around evolution of laser technology with a little bit of history. And then ask the question, can lasers be smarter as well as faster? So by way of background, um, this ethnographic work uh, looking at the time spent during ureteroscopy doing different processes and procedures shows that whether you're a duster or a fragmenter, the majority of the procedural time is spent in lithotripsy and removal of the stone. So as you see on the right hand side, uh, if you're a duster, 63% of the time involved in a ureteroscopy typically is spent uh, using the laser to 
break down the stone into dust. And if you're a fragmenter and basketer, um, those two tasks combined take up a similar proportion of the procedure. So improving this uh, through laser technology uh, should improve uh, procedural efficiency. So we've been testing a prototype laser in collaboration with Boston Scientific. Uh, and this prototype laser introduces micropulse technology. And we've been testing this in bench test uh, systems. So let's just review uh, the objectives of laser lithotripsy. Uh, the first thing, as I've mentioned, is to optimize the rate of stone destruction, uh, particularly if we're dusting. This is the bit of the procedure that takes the longest time. Uh, secondly, we've got to think a little bit about the size of particles that we're generating. And the data in this publication from earlier in the year suggests that we should be thinking about particle sizes of less than 250 microns if we want them to be suspended uh, in the irrigation fluid and to wash out of the kidney uh, rather than lodge in the kidney after the procedure. Um, this uh, particle size uh, and the retropulsion is also important. So we want to remove or reduce the retropulsion element of the procedure so the stone doesn't move around so much. But similarly, we want to retain good vision and that's partly due to particle size and partly due to flow. And with these higher powered lasers, we also want to think about minimizing heat production because particularly with the newer lasers, we can really improve the in, um, dusting but we might be using very high energies, which could be leading to heat issues within the kidney. So let's look at the evolution of lasers um, over the last 40 years or so. Um, initially, lasers were relatively low powered, 20 or 30 watts. And then the changes that occurred were we introduced higher wattage lasers, which could um, fire higher frequencies. And we also added pulse widening, uh, which reduced retropulsion. But most recently, there's a lot of talk around pulse modulation, uh, particularly in the P120 Moses systems, where the pulse is split into two pulses, uh, the first to open a gas bubble, and then the second to fire through that button bubble to hit the stone and fracture off the surface of the stone. And then perhaps most recently are the pulsed thulium lasers, uh, the thulium fiber lasers, uh, which can generate very high frequencies with low pulse energies uh, for very fine dusting. And what I'd like to introduce today is the concept of advanced pulse modulation. So taking both the high frequency that we see with the pulse thulium fiber lasers uh, and some of the effects of the pulse modulation uh, that we see with the Moses laser and try and get the best of both. So as I said before, if you look at these three graphs, the bottom is a schematic of the Moses laser. It's a double pulse in the Moses. Uh, the first opens a bubble and the second fires through the bubble to hit the stone. This should uh, reduce the uh, amount of retropulsion and improve the amount of energy hitting the stone in that second uh, pulse. You can see here, if we fire the laser at 40 watts, setting could be uh, half a joule. At 80 hertz, this would be a sort of a popcorning setting, perhaps, uh, with the Moses. The thulium fiber lasers uh, depicted in the middle graph. Uh, here, we've increased the frequency to, say, 400 hertz. Um, and these pulses are fired evenly at high frequency with even spaces between them. Each pulse has an energy of around uh, 0.1 joule or 100 millijoules. And this setting would give you the same 40 watts. The prototype laser we've been testing, uh, instead of firing them evenly, fires these pulses in packets. So within each packet, as depicted here, there may be 24 or even up to 32 micropulses um, fired as very closely together. And that will hopefully give us an extended Moses effect because some of those pulses will pass through bubbles to hit the stone and some will generate new bubbles between the laser fiber and the stone. Because these pulses are very small and fired in packets, although the packet frequency is only around, say, 20 hertz, if there are 24 um, micropulses within each packet, that gives you overall 480 of these micropulses per second. 
and it gives you the same 40 watts. So this is just delivering the same amount of total energy, but in different ways. And this is the concept of pulse modulation. So if we look at this, this just shows you um, different Hertz settings for the packets. So as we go down these different graphs, the top one is five packets per second and the bottom one 20 packets per second. But each packet contains multiple micro pulses. And each one of these packets is opening an extended Moses effect, creating bubbles between the laser fiber and the stone so that other micro pulses in that packet can hit uh, without the bubble having to form uh, and hopefully chip away at the stone rapidly. By turning up the energy on the laser, we can increase the size of each of these packets. So a one joule setting on the laser would give you 42 millijoule pulses and 24 of these in each packet and the packet would last two milliseconds. If we turn up to two joules, the micropulse, uh, each micropulse increases to 84 millijoules. There are still 24 in the packet and it still lasts two milliseconds. And if we increase further to three joules, the micropulse energy increases and the number of pulses per packet also increases by increasing uh, slightly the packet length. And the top setting is 36 uh, micropulses per packet uh, at 97 millijoules each, and this packet slightly longer at three milliseconds. So by turning up the power, the, the sort of the comb, uh, the teeth get longer and the comb gets longer, but still all of these pulses are firing very rapidly and close to each other. So what do these bubbles that they generate look like? On the left hand side now is a standard uh, pulse. Um, here's the video. So in a standard pulse at one joule, that's a standard one joule of energy being deployed into uh, the liquid. And you get a large bubble forming, which then collapses. And this is what generates retropulsion. And that one bubble has to both, what that one pulse has to both generate the bubble, but also transfer energy to the stone to cause um, dusting or fracturing of the stone. If we look at the right hand side, this is actually three joules of energy. So three times the amount of energy in the packet, but fired as multiple micropulses. And as you can see, the bubble is very prolonged both in terms of it's elongated away from the end of the laser fiber, but also the bubble itself lasts for much longer. And that means other pulses in this train of micropulses will get through and hit the stone uh, further away from the laser fiber without any uh, impedance from the water. So we've done some bench testing of this prototype uh, and this first graph shows ablation rate of a reference laser. Uh, and this uses uh, Bago stones. Uh, and we try this across a range of power settings. Uh, as you see, as you turn up the power, the, you increase the ablation rate, which is the amount of milligrams per second of stone that's ablated. Um, we're pleased to see that the prototype laser here uh, shows significant increase uh, by firing in these different uh, modulated pulses, probably uh, twice the ablation rate across the whole spectrum of power settings. Because that bubble that you saw earlier extends away from the tip of the laser fiber, and because it forms that sort of chain, then it creates a link between the fiber and the stone. And that means that those subsequent pulses can pass through to the stone. And so that should give us a working distance away from the tip of the fiber uh, that is greater than a single bubble or even a couple of uh, pulses uh, firing. So here this shows that even uh, at two or up to three millimeters away from the tip of the fiber, uh, we can still see a uh, degree of ablation. Uh, obviously it decreases the further you are away from the tip of the fiber, uh, but it is still able to transfer effect uh, over this distance, which is important because it means that the condition doesn't have to be uh, touching the stone in order to ablate it. Uh, and this can be an advantage uh, when we're operating uh, inside the kidney. Uh, we may not be able to reach the stone exactly, and it gives us a little bit of tolerance in the system. Uh, we also looked at particle size analysis. So in this setup, a stone from a dog of different compositions, that's the stone, uh, is placed in a container. 
and then the laser is fired from below and the particles that it uh, generates are all collected uh, and passed through an analyzer. And as you recall from that earlier um, uh, video, uh, with the particle size we're looking for is less than 250 microns. And you can see here the mean uh, particle size here is around 30 to 50 microns and 90% of the particles are below that sort of threshold uh, that we're talking about, even for the harder stones such as um, uh, calcium oxalate monohydrate. So we think it's uh, forming particles of a suitable size. And the other tests that we started to do are looking at retropulsion. And by delivering uh, these micropulses in packets, again, the idea is we're not creating very large bubbles. And initial uh, data that we have suggests uh, that the retropulsion will be relatively limited um, with this uh, type of modulated uh, uh, pulse. So in summary, um, we believe that this uh, prototype laser offers a higher frequency than a standard holmium laser, up to 720 micropulses uh, per, per second, uh, which should give a very rapid ablation. Uh, the Pulses are small, uh, less than uh, 100 millij uh, millijoules, uh, and they're delivered in packets. And because these packets uh, fire the pulses very close together, it gives an extended Moses effect, uh, which should reduce the number of bubbles forming, but also increase the amount of energy transferred uh, to the stone surface. Uh, and because these pulses are all relatively small, uh, it should reduce retropulsion and create fine dust uh, by chipping away with small amounts of energy in each uh, pulse uh, rather than large uh, energy which would crack or fragment the stone. So what we have been looking at and hoping is that the uh, laser pulse modulation techniques that we've been looking at will provide smarter ways to deliver the same uh, laser power that we've been using typically uh, for stone surgery. Uh, thank you for your time and thank you for listening to uh, this uh, talk on pulse modulation and I hope you find it interesting. Well I have to say thank you very much indeed to all of our speakers for a wonderful session, really interesting, some great questions coming in throughout that as well and I hope that that's given us a bit of an idea of what our future might look at in years to come. Thank you very much and thanks again to Baus for, for running this fabulous session. Thank you everyone.